So I'll speak about these combinatorial structures called matroids. And basically, it's a collection of subsets of a given finite set satisfying property one and two that I'll show. I'll call those subsets independent sets, and those should satisfy one, every subset of an independent set is an independent set. And two, we have the so-called exchange axiom, which says that if you have two independent sets, and one independent set is larger than the other independent set, then there is an element in the larger independent set if when added to the smaller independent set, gets a larger independent set. So if you have never seen matroids before, you might think that these two sentences are rather dry, but you will soon see that there is a huge jungle between the, uh, these two sentences. Okay. So you, all of you uh, already know many examples of matroids, so I'll remind you. Uh, so one easy way of constructing a non-trivial matroid is to start with a vector space over your favorite field K, and you choose finitely many vectors, let's say non-zero, and you call a subset of those vectors independent when they are linearly independent over that field. Then this gives a structure of a matroid on the chosen set of vectors, and th this defines a matroid M that we say are realizable over K, where K is your field. And the second example comes from a graph. So whenever you have a finite graph, you call E the set of edges, and you call a subset of edges independent when it does not contain a circuit. So matroids arising this way are called graphic matroids. So in the first picture you see here, you have four general vectors in three-dimensional vector spaces, and on the right you have a graph on four vertices and four edges, which define the same matroid. There is only one non-trivial dependency relation involving all four vectors, one, two, three, four, or all four edges, one, two, three, four. So it turns out that all graphic matroids are realizable over every field, but testing whether a given matroid is realizable over a given field is a difficult problem. So here are some examples where the answers are well known. So the first picture you see here represents a projectivized picture of linear dependency relation among seven elements. And the lines you see here, actually seven lines, including the curved one, shows you all non-trivial dependencies between three vectors or elements. And that is the picture you see from the finite projective plane defined over field with two elements. And that gives one matroid called Fano matroid. And it turns out that that matroid, as an abstract combinatorial structure, is realizable if and only if the field you're working over it has characteristic two. If you delete the, this dependency relation, the curved one, then you again get a matroid on seven elements and of rank three. But, but the new matroid called non fano matroid is realizable over field K exactly when your field has characteristic not equal to two. There are some more exotic matroids, something like this, nine elements and rank three. And you're seeing the non-trivial linear dependencies among those nine points. And this gives a matroid which is realizable over no field. And the main reason is that if you have real realize these nine points in some vector space or projective space, you should see a dependency passing through the middle three points by the Pafos theorem. And in fact, it is known that testing whether a given matroid is realizable over the field of rational numbers Q is exactly as difficult as devising an algorithm to solve arbitrary Diophantine equation, whether it has a solution or not, over Q. So it's a difficult problem. Uh, so I'll uh, talk about one particular invariant of a matroid called a chromatic polynomial. And it's easy to define it what it is in the case of graphic matroids. So you start with a finite graph, G, and you consider this function, function of natural numbers Q. And the value of that function, chi GQ, the chromatic polynomial, is the number of proper colorings of G using Q colors. You count how many ways you can color the vertices of G under one requirement that you should use two different colors whenever two vertices are connected by an edge. 
And it turns out that this function is a polynomial in Q with integer coefficient. So for our previous matroid on four edges or four elements, this polynomial turns out to be a degree four polynomial with coefficients one, minus four, six, and minus three. So if you want to test whether this graph is four colorable or three colorable, all you have to do is plug in Q equal three and four and see whether you have a positive number or not. And the same polynomial is defined for any matroid. So it's a matroid invariant. So the conjecture I'm interested in is concerns this polynomial, or rather the coefficients of this polynomial. And it predicts that the coefficients form a low concave sequence, meaning that that inequality is satisfied for all subscript i. As far as I know, there's really no good reason why this should be true. But, well, you can easily test this conjecture for any given example, and it has survived, and all known matroid constructions out of old matroid preserves the validity of this conjecture. So I'll perhaps indicate one reason why this might be true. So I'll start with an algebraic variety defined over field K, and I'll say that a homology class in whatever your favorite homology class, homology theory, uh, with real coefficient, I'll say that it is a prime if some positive multiple of that homology class is a class of a reduced and irreducible subvariety. And I'm going to collect them all in a set, which is defined to be the closure of the set of d-dimensional prime classes. So this set is not a convex cone. So if you pick two elements from this set, or two homology classes, and if you add them, and there is no reason for the sum to be in this set. It is some set in a finite dimensional real vector space. It's a closed set by definition, but it's hard to imagine what it looks like. It's a collection of all primes. So if you start with product of two projective spaces, then by the Klinner theorem, you can decompose this any uh, one dimensional piece as in this form using the canonical basis consisting of product of linear spaces. So homology classes in this case is simply a sequence that I let write xi. So the space of primes in this case is exactly this set, it turns out. So the condition on the coefficient xi so that the corresponding homology class is prime, there are three conditions. One is low concavity, the second is non-negativity, and the third is the no internal zero condition. So that was a clean answer, but I should point out that this clean structure is not visible if you work with integral homology classes. So if you look at the middle homology of P5 cross P5, and you look at the homology class corresponding to the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 1, then it's low concave, non-negative, no internal zeros. But there is no five-dimensional subvariety of P5 cross P5 with that as a homology class. It turns out that I happen to know that 48 times this homology class is a class of a subvariety. But you, after many, many hard works, you can show that there is no five dimensional subvariety having that as a homology class. Okay. So, permutahedron, the main uh, character of this talk, is a lattice polytope in any dimension. Uh, which is constructed by, for example, taking the point 1, 2, 3, 4 and look at the all coordinate permutations of that point, in this case 24 of them, and taking com convex hole. So by definition, this polytope has, uh, is acted by the symmetric group on n letters, but it has one additional automorphism, for example, sending the point 1, 2, 3, 4 to 4, 3, 2, 1 that corresponds to the additional diagram automorphism of the root system of AN. And it is really a geometric version of AN. And algebraic geometers have a way of looking at lattice polytopes as an algebraic variety. So we can look at the corresponding algebraic variety to the permutahedron. And if you do that, then there is a way of looking at matroids on n elements as a homology class in this permutohedral variety. And it is it's natural in some sense, not the technical sense, but in some combinatorial sense. So I'll write the matroid homology class 
as delta M. It's an all-dimensional homology class in the n-dimensional permutohedral variety. And it is more or less M viewed at different rates. And the main property is that for any field K and any matroid, this homology class delta M defined over any field, or rather defined over the integers, is effective in that toric variety, meaning that you can always write it as a non-negative linear combination of sub-varieties well, over whatever field K. But this homology class delta M is the class of a sub-variety of the permutohedral variety over K exactly when your matroid is realizable over K. That's the if and only if condition. So if you start with, for example, the Fano matroid, the one you have seen before, and you construct this homology class as an XAN over spec C, then over every prime number, it is effective. But only over the prime 2, it is a prime in this sense as an integral homology class. And there are many other examples, starting from non fano et cetera, et cetera. So from these two propositions, you can s construct some non-trivial examples how this homology classes moves depending on the characteristic of the base field. This toric variety is very special in that sense that the anti-canonical linear system moves in a large family. So you can define a regular map to Pn cross Pn. So there is a natural way, again, in a combinatorial setting, to decompose the anti-canonical line bundle as a sum of two positive line bundles. One in each is invariant under the action of this metric group, and the two sum ends are interchanged by this additional diagram automorphism of AN, so that this matroid homology class push forward to some homology class, which I view it as a sequence, and that sequence turns out to be the coefficients of the chromatic polynomial of M that we were interested in. So this is a purely combinatorial computation which is valid for no matter what matroids. But this, if you believe uh, in our example of prime classes in Pn cross Pn, characterized as low concave sequences, then this combinatorial statement proves the low concavity conjecture for all matroids which are realizable over some field because prime classes maps to prime classes. If your matroid is realizable over field K, then I find a sub variety here that has that homology class, and it push forward to some sub variety there. So this sequence should be low concave. Uh, but not just that. Um, in fact, this proposition you have seen in the previous slide shows that the low con concavity conjecture is equivalent to the following statement. If you push forward under this anti-canonical map of the matroid class, then it should lie in the space P of the product of projective spaces, even if your matroid is not realizable over any field. And that statement has verified in many, many cases. And it's true for some mysterious reasons so far. So if that low concavity conjecture is true for all matroids, perhaps one reason for that might be this. For any matroid M and any field K, this matroid homology class lies in the space P of the permutohedral variety XAN. So this would obviously imply the low concavity conjecture by the framework we have developed so far. But something more than that. So I'm almost saying that all matroids are realizable over every field if you view a matroid not as an integral homology class, but as a real or rational homology class. So they, they should be realizable up to a multiple. So I have no evidence for that, except that low concavity conjectures were verified for many non-realizable matroids. In fact, all matroids up to 10 elements. So I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>